Good evening. I'm Liz Schaefer, coordinator of the Food for Thought series here at the NHA. Tonight, we get to celebrate living history with Pauline Cabral Singleton and Viola Cabral Howard, who are going to talk to us about their Cape Verdean heritage and life on Nantucket. The moderator is Francis Cartonen, a 12th generation descendant of Nantucket. So let me just say, so sabi and welcome. Good evening. I'm so pleased to be here with Pauline and Viola this evening for them to tell us about when, why, and how Cape Verdeans came to Nantucket and what they did when they got here. When I was a freshman in Nantucket High School, Viola and two other Cape Verdean young women Carol Mendes and Betty Gomes were juniors. When I won a history essay contest, Carol said to me, you think Nantucket history is so wonderful, but it hasn't always been wonderful for everybody. That planted the seed for my book, The Other Islanders, People Who Pulled Nantucket's Oars. Cape Verdeans literally pulled the oars in Nantucket whale boats and in the United States Life Saving Services surf boats. And they have pulled Nantucket's economic and cultural oars in business, food, music, and healthcare. If Cape Verdeans had not left their islands to come to New England, Nantucket would not be where it is today. Let me set the stage. Have a map of the Atlantic Ocean, please. Here we are. Up on the upper left, we see southern New England. And all the way across the ocean, off the coast of Africa, we see the Cape Verde archipelago. They are a long way apart, and it's a long way to come. And because of winds and currents, there is no crossing the Atlantic in a straight line. One must steer a circular course to and fro. We have the map of the uh, Cape Verde Islands. Here they are. The Windward Islands above and the Leeward Islands below. Many, although not all Cape Verdeans who came to Nantucket, came from two Leeward Islands, the islands of Fogo and Brava. Pauline and Viola, take it away. Tell us about your family. When did your grandfather first come to New England and from which island did he come? My grandfather, John Roderick, R-O-D-E-R-Q-U-I-E-S, Cape Verde Islands of Brava. His first voyage to America was on a whaling vessel. On a whaling vessel, he signed on at the age of fourteen. The trip lasted eighteen months. He never got a salary, and they never sighted a whale. That's a sad story. <laughs> sad. What about your father? Our dad, Josephina Lopes Cabral arrived in Florida in the early 20s, I believe. And he worked, he, he was employed at a, at, a, at a golf course in Florida, he and, and, and several family members and friends uh, that decided to make the journey, the crossing, which was likewise um, his grandpa. Seas are pretty rough. And uh, thank heavens they made it safely. Uh, as I say, they were employed at a golf course, which I, I do not know the the name, but uh, they uh, experience discrimination at some point. Uh, 
once they were established and were uh, going out for dinner, restaurant refused to serve them because of the color of the skin. And my dad, being the man that he was, called the, called the, the uh, rest of the members, the relatives, and they spoke in Creole. At that point, my dad, I guess, as the story goes, spoke to the manager. And they were seated and they were served. And from then on, I guess everything worked out as well because I, I never heard anything differently. Uh, he returned back to uh, Cape Verde when he was 20. Back in 1924. And um, stayed there for a short period and returned back to, to the United States in, around 1926, which, where he lived on Cherry Street with his, his, uh, his brother. So then he had come to Nantucket. And then he, yes, he lived on Cherry Street. He lived there for a while. In my mind, yes. And uh, my, my, my mom also lived, my mom also lived on Cherry Street, a couple of houses up, in fact. Uh, so your father worked for Mr. Vorneville? Excuse me? Your father worked for Mr. Vorneville? Yes, he worked for Vorneville Floors, um, as I say, on, on the uh, center in, in India Street. And uh, out of the goodness of Mr. Vorneville's his kindness, he purchased a home on Orange Street. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, my dad bought the house from Mr. Bonnado. And, and the reason that they had to do it that way was? They did it, yeah, they did it that way because yeah. at that time, people of color were not allowed to really, to, to purchase property. Mm -hmm. So it was actually, it was, it was, purchased on a straw, from what I understand, that was the same. Uh, and they moved in, my mom and dad moved in in uh, 1928 and uh, in the evening. Let, let's, all, have all was all their let's put up the picture of their beautiful wedding. Okay. There, there it is. Yes, that's... Um, my mom and dad. In 1928, right? 1928, July 28th, 1928. And the uh, matron of honor, my aunt, Isabella Holmes Mendes, and re my relatives, her daughter, uh, Louise, and Bella, and Bella, and uh, Dorothy, Dorothy Burgo, two cousins. Our two cousins, and I say uh, Elizabeth Mendes, our cousin, and I can't think of it. So they had a very elegant wedding. wedding. Yes. It wasn't in the church. No, no, no. It wasn't in the church because they weren't allowed, again, because of the color of the skin. So they were married at the rectory. And I believe all the flowers came from Bonneville, because you see there has a yes. beautiful flowers. Yes. So they moved in the very day of their wedding into the house on Orange Street. Lily Weds, yes. Yes, that's correct. And it's still in your family today. It's still in the family 90 92 years later, with lots of love and beautiful memories. Um, so what has gone Special on there Christ. in all these years? Well, we've had, we say, christenings, and we've had family reunions. family reunions. We've had just getting together with family or friends. 
uh, the door's always been open. That was my father's philosophy was always be good to people because you never know one day my children may be somewhere and someone will open, open the, door the door to them if they're in need. And that he did. He took everyone in, whoever came to the island, he met a friend, he would bring them to the house. And uh, he would meet them and feed them. Feed them, yes, and spend some quality time with them. Spend time, get to know. And um, it's still going on today, pretty much generations down. We still do that. Yes, we, have, we have our family gatherings and friends and so forth because that's the foundation, the beautiful foundation that they left yeah. us. They pass it on. A very they passed it on to they us. pass it on to us. Let's put up the next picture. Yeah. That's the hunters. Yeah. yeah. Tell, tell, tell us about what these guys are up to. Well, they're up to hunting. A great day of hunting. Rabbit, pheasant, uh, geese. geese, duck, deer, duck. But the seasons are, are natural. I mean, the, I would say the seasons, but they, there's at that time, deer was only one week. Rabbit, I believe, was like a month or two. But anyway, uh, any case, they they hunted, they hunted for uh, for our Thanksgivings. We always had game, and uh, you say it was well well prepared, uh, seasoned. Because I say cleaned. And marinated and very tasty. And my and fried, the best rabbit. And the, she fried the yeah the best, best rabbit. rabbit. And, and 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 friends, some friends said, oh, I I don't eat rabbit or I don't eat pheasant. She would tell them it was chicken. <laughs> and once they finished, they said, oh, that was some good chicken, BB. She said, no, that was rabbit. rabbit. I said, oh my goodness. <laughs> they enjoyed it. They enjoyed. It. So that was particularly a, a tradition for Thanksgiving, that the guys would go hunting and the food would be cooked. Yes. And they yeah, always had the, the meal after they hunted. Mm -hmm. We always ate a late Thanksgiving because that was a, it was a tradition. The first thing they, on Thanksgiving, they would go hunting and we prepared the food, my mom, and our dinner may have been like four or five o'clock at night. It wasn't an early dinner. And then after Thanksgiving, Oh, well, we have pictures actually of some traditional uh, Cape Verdean food. So here is Jag. Jag. Mm -hmm. what, what is that? That's uh, a staple. Jag is the rice and beans. You can use any kind of beans. You can use say, lima beans, kidney beans, pinto beans. And something like that. And, uh, Lisa, something. Linguisa. If you'd like a little, add a little meat to it, you could put some linguisa and some put even squash, you know. So it's it's a staple and it's filling and it's very tasty. Let's have the other picture. The next there. Manchu. Manchu. Yeah, and that's the Manchu that also called Kachu. Well, we call it Manchu. Um, various, I guess, islands. But I understand the correct, the correct uh, Definition is munch, is kachu. Uh, that's a combination of, I just, everything, my, uh, it's beans, it's two or three different beans, it's uh, the samp, which is like a corn, uh, a dry corn. Uh, as you can see in this, they have like, I guess it looks like kale yeah, or uh, you can put linguisa or meat, but I stay with the beef, pork. Uh, I may throw some, I may use some linguisa at some point, but a ham bone is great. And in fact, I made some yesterday and it was rather tasty, rather, I mean, it was, it was great. We had some for lunch before we came lunch today. today. I've made it over, over in the uh, Caribbean islands of Anguilla and uh, 
introduced them to it and they loved it. They said, oh, that corn soup was delicious. And I made it for all my nephews and great nephews and family and friends. And they just love Aunt Vi's my soup. Andrew will be here in the next couple of days and I wanna make sure I have, I, I put some aside, I saved his little in the corner. So that uh, he'll have his manchu yeah. before he returns and back Paul to lives Europe. In Connecticut. He's a aunt Bible makes the best manchu. He lives in Connecticut. Augie Ramos made good manchu too. Yes. Yeah. He did. Uh -huh. yeah. He did. I miss him. I miss him so much. So after cooking a lot for Thanksgiving, the next holiday that would come along would be Christmas. And then there was the tradition of the Canta race. Canta race. And tell us, tell us about all that. What, what was that like? Well, most of the men would farm on Washington Street at Manual Domes, and they would have their instruments, their tambourines, their maracas, uh, accordion, and, and they always carried an American flag. Uh, they would visit most of the homes that were open, and some homes had uh, 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 altars that set up, and they would enter the home and one person would say a prayer and after they, they would serenade and they would uh, stroll all down into Main, Main Street, Washington Street, they got the five corners. All the Cape Verde homes. All, all, all the, the Cape Verde. All the Cape Verde tunes they were playing. And then after the last house that they visited, that's when they gathered and they were celebrating the new year. And that could have been like five, six o'clock in the morning because that, that was a party time for them. So this would begin at it Christmas begin the, and last all the way to New Year's. It, it would go into it. it New Year's was the biggest for them. Yeah, they started with the biggest, the biggest event was on New Year's. And they would and they would they would chant, they would sing, you know, uh, they would they would stroll and they they would they would uh, serenade as they as they and you would hear it throughout the street at night. They would play the, the instruments and they would serenade as they walked. And they went to another house, someone entered their door, because the house was always open to them, the families were open to them, and they always went into the home, uh, said a prayer, came out and went to the, to the next home. And the last home, as I understand, is when they uh, gathered and they celebrate the new year that was coming in. And they didn't stop it, until the sun came up. It was the sun came up. And I remember my, when my dad came in, when he came home, my, uh, he would always give some uh, 50 cents that would kiss him New Year's. And it was my brother, Joe, because I was always asleep. <laughs> they never got home until six in the morning. It was late, late morning when they got in. That must have been wonderful. It, it, it was, yeah, it was hot and warm. I just loved it. I just loved it. We have another picture of the Compass Rose mural. Oh, this is Jack. There we go. Yeah, there it goes. Yeah. Why? Why do Cape Verdeans love this mural? Well, I think it's because they feel that that they're not that far away, three thousand miles, and perhaps they know they see the whale, see the water. So I guess they, when they come, they feel pretty much at home. I think I've heard that any any Cape Verdean who comes to Nantucket to visit stands in front of this mural and points to the fact that it says Cape Verde Islands, 3,200 miles. Out the way, yes. It's really pretty, pretty nice that when H. Marshall Gardner painted this mural that he included how far it is I know. from the islands. It's been there for years. It has been, it has been. It has it's a landmark, it's a landmark. Connection between in an island. I think you put it on a t-shirt once, didn't you? That mural? Yes, we did have a, a one of the Nantic mm -hmm. t-shirts. Yes, mm -hmm. we did. Yeah. Well, people who would come to visit Nantucket and stop in front of the mural were generally coming to Nantucket for Cape Verdean festivals. And that got started when you formed the, the sons and daughters of Cabo Verde. Uh, so could you tell us a bit about that organization and how and why you started it? 
Well, the um, group started, the organization started. It was just through uh, sitting at home, Pauline and I, Norma sitting in the kitchen, just shooting the breeze, chatting. And uh, conversation came up about why not a Cape Verdean uh, club or here on the island? And said, so, well, we never really gave it that much thought. So uh, from there, I say, Norma's the one who planted the seed. From there, it took off. We did the best that we could. We went out, we canvassed. We had uh, support from the community. Uh, and uh, we uh, worked on a charter. Once we had our charter, then and we went from there. And uh, so we, 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 the festival took place in, was that I, in 1988? 1988 was the first, yes, that was the first festival and that was held at the um, Knights of Columbus Hall on Cherry Street. We had, we had friends and family and guests and people, I mean, from all over, from, from the Cape Cod, from even say California, from really? Connecticut, from, yeah. from, uh, New Bedford from Providence. I mean, just, the list just goes on. They knew that, that that was the date. Once they found out the date, then every year after that, they were here for the Cape Verde Festival. It was known to be the best festival in New England. Yes. The best yes. festival. Yes. And for the first one, you had um, dignitaries. Um, oh, yes, the prime minister. Yeah. From the Cape yeah. Verde. Yeah. yeah came in and he stayed at my brother's home and had security for him. And he presented my brother with a flag of the Cape Red Islands. And that was that was quite, for us, it was a big thing. You know, trying to listen to the Cape Red Islands come to a small island. Yes. And, you know, it was. Do, do you speak at the Unitarian Church? Yeah, we had a speaker, his name was Jolly Gonzales. He came in as a speaker. And he brought flag? And we had the flag. He, he brought had, a flag. And, and, he, and he presented the flag to my brother. The cake running flag, he presented it to my brother. Yeah. Let's have the first picture. We have some from the festivals. There we go. That's my <laughs> brother in law and his, yeah, Mark Terreno and Jack, yeah. you know, Mark Terreno, no, no, Jack, Jack Terreno and Roger New. Roger is my sister's husband. And they're wearing the t-shirts the with the 30 acres. flag. Yeah, the 30 acres, yes. It was that the no, first that was, that was. And they're doing what Cape Verdeans do well, they're cooking. Oh, yes, yes. yes. We all had to, we, and after the festival, all the women did all cooking. We did all the cooking. And <laughs> some did. men cooked as well. Yeah, they did. <laughs> and where was this? It was, did you all? No. Uh, uh, that I looks 30 like, acres, no? No, that looks like, that looks like, well, that was the first, that was the first year. Uh-huh. I mean, As you can see, a jack. The first year, yeah. so I don't. I, I, that I would think would be at the Knights of Columbus. Because Jack and Roger are cooking. You see, Jack has a spoon, and Roger has the piece of chicken. <laughs> they're, they're cooking. So they have nice T-shirts. And the next picture we have is of souvenir T-shirts. So uh, there's the flag, and then there's. Um, a whale ship with a map of Nantucket to one side and the Cape Verde Islands to the other side, and the whale ship in making the passage in between. I don't recognize that. No, I don't recognize that. Well, um, I guess there were t shirts for every festival and they were different. And um, but I, to so Norma's that... son says he has about he has a number of them, and each one has different pictures on. Oh, every year we had. Oh, yeah. t-shirt. every year we had a, a different. Uh, but that that ship to me, uh, that's is, that, is that a, a whaling ship? It looked like a. I don't know. It's got a lot of sails on it. I think it has to be a whale ship. It is oh, a whale okay. ship, but I don't okay. recognize it. Yeah. I now to the it. right is that the map? I see the the left is the island. Then so I see the, the, to one side and all the islands to the other side. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
yeah. and that's not the flag they have today. No, no it's no, not. That was the first. No. The fl flag of today is here. Yeah. It's a new flag. So now, now they have the blue flag with the red and white. And the white exactly. Yes. But and it's, previously they had this other one. This is what we have now. This is the flag. <laughs> it's very beautiful. It is. It's it is, different. yeah. Um, so let's have one more picture. Yes. Brother Johnny, the vocalist. Yes. I see Brother John. Because you can't, you can't think about Cape Verdeans without thinking about music. Oh, and absolutely. Music, yep. Yeah. So good. there's the flag, uh, the Cape Verde flag, as well as the American flag. American flag. Mm -hmm. And you've got a band, but that the band isn't a Nantucket band, right? No, they're from they're from the uh, Cape Cod, and and my brother would always uh, whenever there was music because he was quite the musician, self-taught. He played several instruments: accordion, uh, keyboard, uh, piano, guitar. And plus he sang. He was a great and, vocal, and, vocalist. And, and uh, he, he really enjoyed music. Well, and well, I mean, you, have a, you have a twin brother who's also a musician. Yes, Paul. He plays saxophone, Paul. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's pretty good, too. I, I think all Cape Verdean families are musical families. They are musical. Yeah, musical and the voices. And they are. And as a matter of fact, uh, the island of Fogo and Brava had the best violinists. Those two islands. And I think the Fogo and Brava are the, the musical islands. I don't know too many about the other islands, but most of the music from Fogo and Brava. So when you had these festivals, you made money. Yeah, I thought it would be made money, but it went out quickly. And, what, and tell us what, what you did with the money you raised from the festivals. Well, we decided once we uh, were established and had some money coming in that we would uh, form uh, scholarships for the Nantucket students, Nantucket graduating high school uh, students. We started off, I believe, with the, it was a three hundred dollars because that's all we could afford at that time, uh, and it was to uh, uh, a female and male. And then, as the years went on, we went. Uh, we says, okay, well, we can maybe do five hundred dollars, and then eventually it was a thousand dollars. For a, a stu two, two students of the uh, graduating class of that year. And it wasn't necessarily to Cape Verdean high school students. Sometimes. No. The most of no. we didn't have Cape Verdean no, uh, graduates. There weren't, so it there weren't went, that many. Yeah. Uh, it was not too there many. Were only a few. Yeah. So. And, and you, kept, you kept giving scholarships even after you didn't do the festivals anymore. Yes, we, yes, we did, yes. We, yeah. After the money ran out. To, yes, yeah. 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 Sadly to say that. Yes. That we would hope the next generation will pick up on it, but it never happened. Yeah. We were told the foundation, start the group, and then, you know, it, it didn't happen. I think the festivals are really missed. Yeah, you have such good memories of them. Oh, plenty of memories. Yeah. Plenty of memories. Yes. I have people that still ask, oh, are you, do you, you know, are you still having the Cape Verdean Festival? Why? What happened? This is well, we're all older now and uh, we've lost, you know, a few, a few of our members. So, uh, like they say, the younger generation, we thought we'd pass it on down to them, but that didn't work. So. And when the festival was yeah, over, as I understand, the musicians would play mm -hmm. all the way to Hyannis. Oh, it, never, no. it, it ended on Nantucket and it could stay on at the, on the boat. Mm -hmm. That must have been a lot of fun. It was oh, so yes. much fun. It was they so much fun. It. it was a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was well worth it. it.
Well, there's one, one more um, picture, and that is taken aboard the Ernestina. Ernestina, yes, it's by oh, and yeah. Joe. Yeah. Joe. And you were on your way, the two of you were on the Ernestina traveling to, from Nantucket to New Bedford, right? Right. Yeah, they had they had come over for it was, a, it was anthropologists that came over for the night, and oh, go ahead. yeah, and we served them at the at Orange Street. We served them all the hit the music and we served them all the food. And a, a woman, her name was Trouty. She was from Australia, and she invited us to take a ride back to New Bedford. So we took what food was left over. We got some uh, cots from the A P then put everything on the boat and serve the galley, it went to the member of the galley. And it was such an eventful trip. And I think it was a seven hour trip. And it was my brother's yeah. birthday. So we celebrated his birthday on the boat as well. The, the special thing about the Ernestina is that for many years, she traveled between New England and the Cape Verde Islands. Yes. Taking things to Cape Verde and bringing people back. Yes. Right? And what, what was it like for people getting on the Ernestina in Brava, for instance, and traveling all the way to New England? I don't know too many people that took that voice coming over. So uh, I, I'm not too sure, but I know just going over with Trouty, but she explained a lot to us huh? what the trip was like. Yeah, she uh, She was a crew member she, on the Ernestina. She was a crew member and she, she knew. So when you when you were sailing aboard her on your way to New Bedford and mm -hmm. you were in the galley, could you feel the the presence of all of those people who went? Uh, absolutely, yes, yes. absolutely. I don't know how they're able to go down there and stay thirty days on that. And have to sail and go down in the galley and and sleep in bunks. It, it, it was, was quite, it was crucial. It was crucial. Quarters were very tight. Yeah. I mean, what you could you could just. I can say you could feel the the uh, the, the uh, music, or you could hear the say, music. You could visualize them playing cards, yes, talking, yeah. singing. Um, it was and rough weather sometimes. It, it was rough. It was scary, and it was rough. But they they made it, and we lost a lot of a lot of, of uh, coming over. I, I'm thinking of what it must have been like for families with children families. to get yes. on that boat. I understand when mom came over, there were 30 days at sea and she would take care of all the little infants on the boat because the mothers would get sick. And my mother was the one that was a little nursemaid, you know, and she said that, you know, she never wanted to travel on the boat again. But after 30 days, like I went through the Bermuda Triangle and there was no wind at all. So with her, that was her end of, you know, boats. And it was a difficult time getting her to go on a boat, even to go to New Bedford. It had to be a very, flat very calm. sound day. Very, and even then she flat. didn't like it. Um, flat day. Flat, I, flat day. I remember how long it was um, on the steamboat between New Bedford and Nantucket. It was five hours to New Bedford. I, I did that when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I've done it a couple of times. Yeah, five hours. Five hours. Yeah. Yeah. No. Well, we're sort of coming to the end. We've come to the end of the pictures. Uh -huh. um, when your parents were young in Nantucket, they faced a lot of discrimination, but they also encountered real kindness, for instance, from Mr. Bonneville. Oh, yes. The, not all those issues have gone away. Not, no, they haven't. They're still here, unfortunately. Fran, may I, could I add, add something to please 120 Orange, Orange Street? Um, it's very, very special to all of us. But my sister here, because she has a twin brother. So I believe they are the oldest, or will be the oldest twins on Nantucket. Yes. So that's special. It is special. Number two, special, second 
is because my brother, John, that was singing, he was delivered at the house because my mom couldn't get to the hospital. So my aunt delivered him at the homestead. So it's, it, it, it's uh, extra special. And I was a New Year's baby of the year 1940. Not on New Year's Day, but a few days after. Did they so sing? There's been a lot going on that one time. Did they sing I, when you were born? Excuse me? Did they sing special songs to you? Uh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so and I also have a granddaughter that was born. At the house? At the house. She was home birth at the house, yes. So there's a lot of a lot of love and a lot of beautiful yeah. memories. Yeah. Orange Street was a lively home. It was a lively home. And everyone, the doors were always open. It was a lively home. It was a lot of love, compassion. It was lively. So all those years ago, when we were in high school, and Carol said to me, you think it's so wonderful, but it hasn't always been wonderful for everybody. And it's so true. And yet there has been a lot of wonderful times. Oh, absolutely. Happiness in spite of it. Yes. Oh, it has. Yes. I can say that. Um, so Viola is wearing a button with the old Cape Verde flag. Yes. And in the middle, there's the new flag. Yes. Um, Pauline, you're wearing a button from one of the Cape Verde festivals. Yes, and I have the Ernestina. And you're wearing the oh. Ernestina proudly. Yes. These are all symbols that are very important to Nantucket. Cape Verdeans. Oh, so proud to wear it. <laughs> yes. The Ernestina is a really old ship and it's once again being restored, this time up in Maine. But I've been in touch with Rick Lopes, who's making a documentary film about it. Uh -huh. And um, I think we all hope that uh, as soon as she can sail again, she'll come back to Nantucket. Oh, I'd love to hear. Oh, I, I love hope so. oh, I'd that. Love that. Wonderful. Well, I was put in charge of questions and answers, and I see there are 11 questions. So let me see what they are. That would be interesting. OK, we'll listen. OK. I don't know about the answers, but we'll listen. There's a question, and I, I think I know the answer, about you're working at the Whaling Museum. And I think you both worked at both the Mariah Mitchell Association and the Whaling Museum when you were young. Yes. Yeah. That was. I was, to be I was 18 in a, when I, uh, at the Whaling, and I got a dollar an hour and the entrance fee was 25 cents. <laughs> <laughs> 25 cents to come and win. And my dad worked at uh, my mom, my dad, and Vi worked at the Whaling Museum. I left there, I think, when I was 18. And that's when they took over for a number of years. Someone has asked about whether you pronounce it Cape Verde or Cape Verde. And I, I think you just pronounce it Cape Verde. Cape Verde. Right. Some say Cabo Verde or Cape Verde. Cape Verde. Oh, Cape Verde. Cape, Cape Verde. Verde. It's Cape Verde. Because in Portuguese, and particularly in Creole, you leave off the last vowel, right? right. Yes. The yes. language is spelled as if it was Creole, what people pronounce it, Creole. Yes, Creole. Mm -hmm. And once, a long time ago, I remember being at the chicken box with you all, and we danced the mazurk. The mazurk. It's a perfect, a very popular. So those, those vowels are all silent. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Let me see. Ah, okay. Oh, <laughs> my friend Barbara White. Well, Barbara White. Yeah. She she said, "Are you two related?" <laughs> <laughs> But she knows me because she's I'm Andrew's mom, so she, she may not, well. But she might not know Viola. 
Oh, no, she, she knows me as she well. She knows by. Yeah, she knows by. She and, she and Mark, they know me. Yeah, Mark they know and, me yeah, well. Yeah. I, I also know another sister of yours, and that's Norma. Yes. Yes. And how many of how many were in your family? Because there was John and Joe and you three. Oh, Brian, oh. six of us. That was a nice big family. Yes, it certainly yes. was. A loving family. I have a question and I don't think anybody knows the answer to it, but it's how many Cape Verdeans are currently living on Nantucket and I have no idea. I have no yeah. idea. The family have diminished. There's not yeah. too many of us on Nantucket now. No. I think we're the oldest generation. <laughs> the two of us. Yeah. Just about. Yeah. There's a, a wish expressed here, a fond wish that there could be another Cape Verde festival, heritage festival on Nantucket. That would be nice. Oh, I would love. Oh, get get the young wonderful. folks on board. Get the young folks on board. I yeah. would love to see that happen. That's so oh, would I. Too. Once, once we can all be together without putting on masks. Yeah, yes. how true, how true. <laughs> yes, that would be great. Um, well, here's here's a comment, not not a question, and that was that the the Ernestina was actually a gift to the people of the United States from the Republic of Cabo Verde. Mm -hmm. Yes, and they decided to do that when they got their independence from Portugal in 1975. Yes, mm -hmm. and she's now particularly, I think, um, a gift to the people of Massachusetts. And when she's restored, she's going to come back to Mass Maritime, I've heard. That sounds that, great. That wouldn't be so very far away. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, that would be wonderful. You're right in Mass, you're not in New England. So, someone is wondering about to what extent do people go back to the Cape Verde Islands to visit. I know Augie went and Barbara Carvalho's been there. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. But it, it's a long, long trip. That it is. Yeah, Augie yeah, always yes. have a barrel. He would take a lot of barrels to Cape Verde Islands for those that were in, for in desperate need. So that was something that Augie, I think he did like once a year. And the, and the, the uh, I, I have some great well, photos of Augie there. <laughs> yes, yeah. 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 We did, we also shipped barrels over to the, the club did. The, 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 uh, yeah. The, we, we shipped over several, oh my, maybe eight or 10 barrels of clothing and various, you know, medicines that we, uh, you know, aspirins or. We did that. I read somewhere that for every one person who lives on Cape Verde Islands, there are two two Cape Verdeans who are living somewhere else in New England, in Europe. Mm -hmm. in, in Holland, Europe. in Holland, yeah, 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 yeah. And and their contributions support the economy in the islands. Yes. Mm -hmm. So they call it the diaspora. <laughs> Good name for it. Yeah. Um, oh, you know, I remember trying to get some interest going a little while ago about creating a Nantucket Cape Verdean heritage trail. Places on Nantucket that are, are significant to Cape Verdeans. And it hasn't it hasn't happened yet. But do you think that's something that, that would be interesting would be possible? I would think so. Yes. I think the first thing would just be to get in a car with a notebook and a tape recorder <laughs> and drive around town. That'll be a start. Well, you know, five cars were the busiest area. Five corners. Cherry Street and Washington Street. Cherry Street, yep. Yeah. Washington Street, 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 Long Street. Yeah. Eagle um, Lane, had a few on Eagle mm -hmm. Lane. Yeah. Um, yeah. I counted. 
a question about how how are the Cape Verde Islands doing with the pandemic? And I, I don't know at all. Have you heard? He was telling me they have not had one death. They had one, one death on, on Brava. Oh, that's. It's a room. He was on, you know, messaging with me. And he showed me a couple of photos of Cape Verde Islands. That there might be a, a case, but there has not been a death. I find that unbelievable. But this is the last I heard. Because these days they do have a lot of um, air traffic in and out of some of those islands because they're developing no, resorts. But they went not allow any into Cape Verde Islands from from, the, from any from the United States. It was the ports were closed for for months. Well, I think. Um, we're, we're sort of wrapping this up. Uh, one, one last question, uh, and that is um, for you, Viola, and you, Pauline, have either of you ever been able to go to the islands? I would love to. We never made it to the islands. Never. No. And at my age now, I don't think I could make it. I don't think I could do it. But I'm telling my children, they need to go, because you still have families on, at, on the Cape Verde Islands. And the young ones, they should be going, like Brad and Craig and Dana and Renee. They need to go to Cape Verde Islands. They need, they do need to yeah. go and see their, their home nice. right there. They need to go. So we'll see if they yeah. work it out. 30, 40 years ago. Yeah, it, it was so just, remote. It was, it was, yeah, it, it was, it was remote. remote to me. Yeah. yeah. But today, naturally, I it's know. all, you know, it's uh, much easier. Well, I think at this moment, and we're much older. We say, it's time to turn it over to Liz. Yeah. Okay, Liz. Well, I just want to tell you that I'm coming over for Manchu, Manchu, because I'm not saying the a, house. I'm not saying the last vowel, Manchu. But, but I'm glad that I wasn't around for for Thanksgiving and having was it your mother telling me I was eating chicken when it was really rabbit? <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. It well, was good. That was good. Yeah. It was good. But, Thank you so much for your stories, and thank you, oh, we're so thank happy you, to Francis, share it with you. Yes. Uh, for being a great, a great moderator. I invite everyone to join us on July fifth for a preview of an upcoming exhibit we're going to have um, called "Shoulders Upon Which We Stand: The Cape Verde Nantucket Connection." And um, you just visit our website for more details as we as we get closer to the July fifth date. Well, Thank well. you to everyone for joining us, especially to our members who make these programs possible. And thank you to Innovation Media for recording this program. So on May 19th, which will be our final food for thought for this season, uh, Cecil Baron Jensen, who is the executive director of Remain Nantucket, will be joining us to talk about rising sea levels and the envision um, we envision resilience Nantucket challenge that is addressing what we can do as an island when the, these sea levels change our lives. Mm -hmm. And finally, I would just like to say that we're thinking about next year. If there are programs that you're interested in hearing, um, topics that interest you, or you know someone who you think has a good story to tell, please share that information with us. Um, you can email me at lshafer at nha.org. And um, as we put together our programs for 2022, maybe uh, something that you've suggested is going to be one of the ones we feature. So oh, thanks. thanks a lot to everyone and we'll see you next time. Well, thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and thank you, Fran.